Hi, thanks for joining me. This is Kumar Matisseri from uh, Rush Medical Center in Chicago, Vascular Interventional Radiology. I want to talk about approaching heavy calcifications uh, during SFA interventions. Uh, this can be kind of the Achilles heel of a lot of the infraangular work that we do in the endovascular space, so I'll take a little dive into it. This is my disclosure slide, as you can see. So things to consider when you're dealing with heavy calcifications is that, especially with lo uh, long, rock-hard CTOs that are calcified, um, you have to understand that everybody wants to be luminal for most cases, but in reality, in these cases, you're going to be subminimal when they're long occlusions, even if sometimes in the short ones. So you have to be ready for that, and that's okay from our experience. We know that as long as you're luminal above and luminal below, that's all that matters. What you do in between the occlusion or in the subminimal space is to get maximum caliber so that the uh, flow goes through that. So that's what's important. Um, in many of CTOs that are not heavily calcified, there are still microchannels that you can use to revascularize luminally, but in these rock-hard occlusions, you tend to lose those microchannels. Uh, therefore, you end up going subminimal almost all the time, and that's okay. Even if you go anterior retrograde, that's the reality in these. Um, so subminimal tracting is totally fine. You just have to decide how aggressively you can treat the uh, inner in-between segment. Tackling these once you've kind of crossed it, decided to balloon it, is you can do spot scenting on areas where the balloon expands, but just uh, the vessel recoils. Um, there's a pave and crack technique where you can line the area with uh, covered self-expanding stent and then reline it with interwoven bare metal nitinol stents and then aggressively balloon it um, angioplasty wise and you have a little bit more comfort since you have a covered stent to protect you from any damage. So that sometimes is something you can utilize in this situation as well. I like to aggressively use uh, scoring balloons in these lesions to really just maximize how much uh, subminimal cracking of that calcium we get. Um, sometimes it almost looks like extrinsic compression in these patients as we'll see. Lithoplasty is a new option or a newer option that we're getting more of our hands on. There's reimbursement codes coming on now so I think we're going to see an increase in that. That may be a sweet spot for some of these um, situations to use advice. Um, the 12-month 12 12 data on their studies out, 12, 24 months is about to come out I believe. Um, so some promising hope for some utilization in, this, in these calcified um, lesions that are hard to treat. So when you're dealing with these cases, this is a 68-year-old patient with end-stage renal disease, has a renal transplant on the right, which is failing. Um, so it was sent to me to be seen for the renal transplant, as well as for life-limiting claudication on the right. Uh, CO2 angiogram that I did, you can see on these two views, there's heavy, uh, heavy, heavy calcific, calcific atherosclerotic uh, stenosis above the transplant, as you see on the left image. Um, the transplant renal artery is patent, and there's also disease below the uh, transplant renal artery. These are both in the external iliac artery. Uh, a little bit more visible how occlusive it is, near occlusive it is on the right image. Um, as you go down the legs, you see that there's heavy, heavy rock hard calcifications throughout the uh, iliac, femoral, SFA, POP. Um, the, the, the DSA images show that there's an occlusion of the SFA, uh, reconstitution of the distal SFA POP, and then um, sort of two vessels above um, the, the ankle, however, goes down to one vessel below the ankle. So my decision was first I got to work on the renal transplant, I decided to stent above and below the renal artery, transplant renal artery, and protect the renal artery with a um, reverse grip catheter during the, the stenting so I know the landmarks. Um, and you can see on the right that the flow has significantly improved, the patient's creatinine improved, and urine function as well. Now I was hoping that there would be some relief of the uh, claudication symptoms, but not much, so brought him back for revascularization. Things you have to consider is am I going to be luminal, which in this case probably not. Partly submittable or mostly, that's more realistic, and what to do with rock hard areas. I do advocate ultrasound on all procedures, but in these few cases, when you're going in the common frontal artery, especially ipsilateral anagrade, you can see the calcifications very well, you can target it very well, so still have ultrasound available, but in these situations, you can stick it directly. You can see very easily that the, the course is subminimal, it's spiraling around the vessel, not luminally, which is totally what I you know, expected. Did pop in eventually into the popliteal artery, you can see the flow there. The ballooning looks not great, but it's still ballooning the subminimal space and has this wavy pattern. Um, early learning lessons, I put a self-expanding bare metal stent, assuming that, that would help quite a bit. Um, you can see these areas right along the middle and distal parts of it that just have this almost like extrinsic compression appearance. And despite aggressive ballooning, did not fully expand. I was hoping that this would provide them enough relief, um, especially quality of life-wise. It did for a little while, however, he came back suspect stenosis or occlusion, and the angiogram, when I brought him back, you can see it's pretty much occluded. So my hope was to get back in there, reline it, uh, be more aggressive. Uh, it was hard to even get through that, so I had to go retrograde, come up um, through the stents, and then snare it, and then have flossing access. I decided to do laser atherectomy, 
and then reline it. I thought this area that still would not respond, I tried to use a balloon expandable bare metal stent and then another self-expanding to really try to crack it open. But I think at that point you've already lost the battle and I think what's important is the first time you, you stent, you need to be really aggressive in your treatment before the stent. And a little bit of learning lesson, but he did get better after that and it has stayed open. Um, in terms of quality life wise, he's doing much better. Um, but it took a couple steps. Another patient, 74, renal failure, cabbage, uh, heel ulcer, former smoker, um, ABIs, as you can see, and toe pressures. He's got an ulcer on the, the heel. Uh, femoral pulses are palpable, however, just tones on the popliteal and uh, ATPT. So when you see these pictures, um, you really have to think about what are you going to do here? Um, does that change your approach? Do you need IVUS? What are the modes of failure? Would you consider vein mapping when you see these patients right away? That's kind of not necessarily just based on the picture, but something to keep in your mind. Uh, questions always about IVUS. You know, IVUS kind of tells you what the plaque looks like on the inside. Just because you have calcified vessels doesn't necessarily mean it looks uh, terrible on the inside, and you can reduce contrast load by using IVUS. So there's some utility of that. It kind of shows you what you're dealing with. Um, plaque modification, I think there's some uh, value to that in my mind for some of these especially. You get less significant dissections, um, lower pressure balloon angioplasty, and I think partly mentally satisfying if you do choose to use drug eluting technology. Um, picture showing that anytime you balloon, you will get dissections, just, just the process that's involved. Uh, whether or not you see them or not, you will get micro dissections, and how significant they are makes your decision on how you're going to treat with it. When I'm dealing with these patients, usually a six or seven French sheath. Um, um, Anagrade ipsilateral will be nice in a lot of these. It depends on if I have an idea what the inflow is like or what their panis is like. There's ways to mitigate that nowadays. Um, I usually start with an 035 system and then de-escalate down to 018 for the most part above the knee. Um, and also some of these patients, I, you know, you can flip the axis to get both uh, inflow evaluated and then go ahead and treat. So it's something that we do, you know, every now and then. It's not that complicated to do once you get your hang of it. Using a reverse curve of catheter and wire, as you see here, you're able to reverse your axis after you evaluate the inflow and if you have to treat or whatever else you need to do. Um, but then you, you see pictures like this, and you say, what are you going to do? And you, you do the contrast runs, and you see the sluggish, sluggish flow. It's almost like a to and fro going through those, those rocks. As you go down here, you can get reconstitution. So for me, you know, I know I'm going to cross with either an 035 or 018 system, and I'm going to pop back in here. Sometimes popping back in here, you might need a re-entry device, which makes it a little bit difficulty when you're trying to cross that calcium. So you might want to adjust it and uh, find a soft spot. You can use IVUS to help you or just kind of oblique it to see if there's any softer areas. You don't want to extend the re-entry too much into the normal vessel. You want to be right at where it reconstitutes. Um, and then usually the runoff, there's access from tibial if you need to go retrograde in these situations. In this patient, 70-year-old, uh, cabbage, renal failure, and the ulcer, um, you can see the heavy calcified disease. Um, even though I'm partly subminimal, I decided to use uh, orbital atherectomy. Uh, you know, again, you have to be careful with experience. You can use it, especially in those entry, re-entry areas, you know, where you popped in, popped out. That tends to be places where it's really hard to get the maximum expansion, whether it be balloon or stenting. So I think, for me, um, I'm okay with short areas of subminimal uh, atherectomy. Um, you have to be careful, you have to think about embolization, you have to think about, you know, complications, but uh, with experience and kind of having an understanding of where and when to use it, it can be beneficial. Uh, in the end, got through, ended up stenting it, and I got a much better response. Uh, this on multiple views, it actually looks better, and the flow did stay open. Patient here, 67-year-old, diabetes, uh, history of cancer, uh, hypertension, and left, uh, sorry, lower extremity rest pain on the right. Uh, kind of a focal area that looks kind of deceiving. It doesn't look so bad, but it's very calcified. So again, decided to do rotational, sorry, orbital atherectomy, um, and then use uh, aggressive ballooning. And then in this one at that time did uh, drug coated balloon and uh, was able to deal with that situation nicely. This patient, however, 69-year-old, uh, end-stage renal. And a lot of these patients are the end-stage renal diabetics. They're the ones that are going to have the heavy, heavy calcium. Second and third toe ulcers and not very good healing. You can see on the initial images here, uh, common femoral and the profunda are open. However, the SFA, as we tend to see a lot of these, are, is out. Uh, decided to use anagrade access, ipsilateral. Um, it's good to get your hands out of the way, but got a wire down, still luminal. Had trouble crossing, so it came from below and uh, stuck the PT, came up. Snared it in, with a micro snare from below and the wire from above and uh, ballooned it and uh, got a nice response. That was actually with laser. So, uh, in the distal segments here. So, uh, ballooned it and got a good response. And not every patient needs a stent, and I felt this was kind of luminal. So, um, 
feel better about it, you can confirm it with intravascular imaging if you need to. 48-year-old diabetes, uh, poorly controlled, failed renal transplant on dialysis now with a uh, left uh, critical limb ischemia. Here, you know, you have your catheter and wire and coming across this heavy calcium in Hunter's uh, canal area. Here's the reconstitution area. You look like you have a short segment here. You might be able to cross it pretty easily, um, so you hope. Um, you get excited. Then you see this, and for those of us operators, we know that we're not in the um, luminal space. We're subminimal. So then you're thinking, okay, you got to figure out what to do. You do pop back in, and you aggressively blue, and you're left with a shelf here. So in these situations, for me, without a doubt, it's going to be aggressive angioplasty, and then um, you can do bare metal uh, interval and stenting there. So for me, in these calcified lesions, getting aggressive, aggressive angioplasty, and if the vessel caliber comes up, good, then I'm going to stent it. Just the approach. Uh, I think it's the last one here, 65-year-old bilateral heel ulcers, uh, poorly healing despite aggressive wound care. Um, as you can see here, heavy calcium coming in the distal SFA pop. It's a scoring balloon. It's having a hard time breaking the waist. Eventually does break it, um, then lined it with uh, bare metal stenting. On his other leg, as you can see here, there's kind of just areas of diffuse calcified disease extending in the SFA, down the pop, into the bloaty segments as well. I thought laser is a good idea here. So as you can see here, firing the laser through there, I do prefer to use a filter protection device, embolization protection device, um, especially uh, in the SFA and POP, that's where I tend to have the heavy, heavy, chunky calcium. And it's very important because you'd be surprised what you see sometimes. This is the ballooning part of it. Um, everybody's seen different levels of uh, debris that we found. Uh, this is the angioplasty here with the scoring balloon and then drug coated balloon in this situation. Um, the result was very nice. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this is from a friend of mine, but this is some impressive calcium. This is actually for mine. Um, that's a lot of calcific burden in there that would have been shot down to the um, tibial and pedal vessels. So that's something to consider because you don't want to take a clodokin into a CLI. Um, so when you're doing these cases, especially rock hard calcification, always think about protection. It's very important. In summary, rock hard calcified revascularization can be some of the most cal uh, challenging cases. Especially with long CTOs, you have to understand you're going to be subminimal, and that's totally fine. When you're re-entering in those situations, if you need to, try to find a soft spot, use adjunctive imaging with IVIS or whatever else you want, obliques to find a safe space to get in. Um, an aggressive, aggressive angioplasty as well as uh, atherectomy if you feel it's appropriate to really prep that vessel for uh, the final ballooning or stenting or whatever you're going to do is very important. Thank you very much.